Hello, this is Brian Smith, and welcome to a special Christmas Day episode of my podcast. Whatever holiday you celebrate this December, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Festivus, or any variation thereof, I want to wish you all a safe and happy holiday. I hope you're able to spend time with family and friends and get away from work long enough to disconnect from the rat race and reconnect with what's important. So on to the episode. Tess Gallagher's on the show today. Tess is an American poet, essayist, and short story writer. Her many honors include a fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation, a National Endowment for the Arts Award, and a Maxine Cushing Gray Foundation Award. Tess has authored numerous collections of poems and short stories, including one of my all-time favorites, The Lover of Horses, as well as Moon Crossing Bridge, a collection of poems she dedicated to her late husband, the legendary short story writer Raymond Carver. In addition to being a prolific writer, Tess taught writing at Syracuse University for 10 years and also collaborated extensively with Raymond Carver, who drew inspiration from Tess, consulting with her on his stories before publishing, and also inspired and shaped Tess's own writing career. After Carver's death at the age of 50 due to cancer in 1987, Tess wrote even more prolifically, drawing inspiration from her Celtic roots, her upbringing in the small logging town of Port Angeles, Washington, her love of horses, and of course, her love for Ray. Tess also consulted with movie director Robert Altman on the Oscar-nominated film Shortcuts, based upon the stories of Raymond Carver, as well as with director Alejandro González Iñárritu on the Academy Award-winning film Birdman, starring Michael Keaton and Edward Norton, which was also based on a Carver story. In fact, director Iñárritu thanked Tess during his acceptance speech at the Academy Awards. I started reading Tess's short stories in the early 90s. I had already been a huge fan of Ray Carver's work and found him to be particularly inspirational as he hailed from my hometown of Yakima, Washington, and had even attended the same community college as me. Yet, despite Carver's non-metropolitan roots, Carver reached the upper echelon in literary circles, becoming an iconic short story writer whose work made it into the cultural zeitgeist in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. After moving to Bellingham, Washington to attend Western Washington University, I actually met Tess at a reading of her book, The Lover of Horses. This is when I became a diehard Tess Gallagher fan. As you will hear in this interview, Tess and Ray often wrote stories together, or at least consulted with each other intensely about the stories they wrote, sometimes resulting in neither author being able to tell where one's influence within a story ended and the others began. Yet Tess's short stories and poems have always been uniquely her own, painting raw and authentic portraits of ordinary folks in ordinary situations with themes of poverty and addiction, of love and longing, memories of childhood, and the influence of ancestors woven throughout. Tess's most recent books is a collection of poems which came out this year called Is, Is Not. Twenty-five years after her reading at a bookstore in Bellingham, where she signed my copy of The Lover of Horses, I connected with Tess through her dear friend Alfredo Aragin, who I interviewed on episode 8. Alfredo has been friends with Tess since they were starving artists in the 1960s in the University District of Seattle. After talking to Alfredo and hearing how close he was to Tess and Ray, I gently nudged him from time to time, asking for an intro to Tess. Well, Alfredo came through and made this interview happen. So Alfredo, mi amigo, thank you. The interview with Tess took place in Tess's home in Port Angeles, Washington, which overlooks the Strait of Juan de Fuca. It took me five hours by car and ferry and then car again to get to her home, but I'm glad I made the trip. I was able to talk to Tess in one of her creative spaces, which I think makes for the best interviews. But one of the most special parts of the interview occurred after we turned the mics off and drove to her second home in Port Angeles. This is the home she shared with Ray Carver all the way up to his death in 87. Tess took me on a tour of this home, where photos of Tess and Ray can be seen throughout along with paintings by her friend Alfredo, hanging on almost every wall. Tess also took me to Ray's office in the home, where he did most of his writing. As I walked through the home with Tess as my guide, I could not help but feel a sense of wonder, inspiration, and gratitude as she welcomed me into what I consider to be a sacred space and a literary historical landmark. Fortunately, I was able to turn the mics back on for some of this tour with Tess, so hopefully, 
the second part of that conversation will make its way into a bonus episode down the road. But in the meantime, please enjoy this wide-ranging discussion with poet and short story author Tess Gallagher, which starts with Tess describing her first meeting with preeminent photographer Annie Leibowitz, who took photographs of Tess for Time magazine. She was used to working with uh, her subjects telling them what to do and, and proceeding out of her ideas of what might make a, a good photograph. And I said to her, you know, I, I think you're just going to keep making the same pictures if you do that. Uh, wouldn't it be more interesting uh, and you'd have a better outcome if you allow your subjects to collaborate with you and to, and to give you something? Um, to add something to your notion of, of what might occur there. And so she took that in, and that's how we arrived at me on uh, the horse Butterscotch, which uh, appeared in Life magazine uh, with uh, black gloves up to my elbows and a silver lame dress on, <laughs> because when she asked me what I thought might be interesting, I said, well, you know, for um, Halloween, I'm going to be Epona, E-P-O-N-A. E okay, and who's that? Celtic goddess. All right. You can Google her And now. this goes back to your Celtic roots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so, so then I told her about uh, Epona, and uh, then she wanted me to go to Iowa and appear on my horse, Angelfoot. But I was teaching, and I couldn't leave my students. You know, when you have writing students, they are connected to your, you know, Poet Central. And uh, <laughs> I just couldn't leave them. So I said, no, that's just not in the cards. So we'll go out here. I know a woman, one of my former students, and she... Uh, has a horse, and we will enlist her, and and we will find horses. So we auditioned another horse before this one, and that horse uh, would not stand still. So uh, Butterscotch turned out to be a great couch of a horse, <laughs> and <laughs> I got up and had my picture taken, and, and I think it's in um, one of her books, at least, one of her collections. Well, I am going to look for that when we're done, because I, mm -hmm. I did not see that when I was researching you, and I, I yeah. love looking at her photographs. She did say on some radio program, I believe it was her television, that 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 conversation with me changed her whole way of working from then on out. At the time, did you know how iconic she was and the people that she was taking pictures of? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. We all did. <laughs> that must have been pretty special. Yeah. Uh. I remember there was another poet staying with me who was giving a reading, Jory Graham. She was very, very beautiful and very talented, still is. <laughs> and uh, I remember... Uh, she, I think she didn't understand why I was being photographed, you know, but uh, <laughs> we got along fine, you know, we had a nice uh, three-way conversations when she was, Annie wasn't just chatting me for her, for her pictures, but it was a kind of a funny thing, you know. <laughs> so the, the horse themes that I, I see in your work, the lover of horses and even in your poetry, Tell us where that started and what what that means to you. Well, I come from uh, a family where the mother, my mother, uh, who lived in these rooms for about, I would say, 60 years, uh, she came from Missouri. And we say Missouri. We don't say Missouri. Okay. And um, so uh, my father uh, sent her a bus ticket to... Denver, Colorado, where she was working for some wealthy people and cooking and taking care of the children. And she came on that bus, and they were married here after a 10-year courtship uh, with some appearances, but mostly letters. Uh, they, they corresponded for 10 years. And that's a kind of an unheard of thing. And only his side of the correspondence survived because he was itinerant and moving from job to job. And my mother came from a farm family, and they always had horses, 
Horses were used in the working, in the plowing, in the farming, and they also had saddle mares. And my uncle, her brother, Porter Morris, uh, worked for uh, the army. He, he was enlisted, actually, by the army to um, mind mules. He was a mule driver oh. in the Second World War. He never went to war, but he prepared mules for combat. Hmm. And um, my my uncle absolutely loved horses, and he bred and raised a horse for me, and gent gentled that horse. And that was a horse named Angelfoot, and he named her because she had one white foot, and she was black, <laughs> and it was as if she had been uh, dipped in in black uh, ink, you know. Yeah. And she was just a darling. She, you could just uh, get inside her and be a horse, really. And I think that the excitement of having that horse affected me very, very deeply. Uh, and uh, I spent a lot of time in uh, those trips to Missouri on horseback. They had a thousand acres, and I uh, rode horseback. You know, all, all that I could of that thousand acres. Yeah, and they they had cattle. They had white face Hereford cattle, uh, and I would go out with my uncle and and take salt to the cattle and herd the cattle. And we also had sheep, and I learned to herd sheep on this horse. It was a very responsive horse. It's very hard to herd sheep, so you have to have a very good horse. So I could ride her bareback. Um, it was a very good. Um, horseback <laughs> woman, you know. Yeah. And there is a picture of me on that mare uh, that is the cover of My Black Horse, which is a British edition of my poems. And I can tell from your description of your upbringing that the, I guess the title story in The Lover of Horses is not biographical for you, or at least not, mostly not biographical. I, I imagine that every story you write has some degree of self uh, there, there, history. There is, there. there is actually quite a, quite a, a lot of of biography in that story. Uh, it's just rearranged a little bit. You know, that's what fiction does. Fiction arranges for something to be truer than than factual. Facts uh, tend to be a kind of cement, you know, and. Uh, when you have cement, you you don't have any prismatic understanding of, of whatever you're talking about, really. Uh, it's just, you know, there you have an imprint, maybe you might call it. Right. Uh, I, I've heard a saying, and I'm probably butchering it, but someone said, if you want to write a story, write a biography. If you want to write the truth, write fiction. <laughs> or something like uh -huh. that, where... Uh -huh. You really don't, with a biography that tries to be factual, uh, you, you do lose sort of the essence and the truth of the story in a way. Um, does that... Truth yeah, is a very yeah. slippery element, you see. So I think fiction is very good, you know, because you have to uh, wrestle the snake, you know. And uh, I think I was just writing to Alejandro Gonzalez in Aritu, uh about fiction and saying that you can reach ultimate truths through fiction. Now, is that the, the movie director you're talking yes, about? Yes, he, he did Birdman and um, The Revenant. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So tell us about your connection to that director and that story, Birdman. Yes. Um, well, I had been in Ireland. You know, I live about uh, a third of the time in Ireland, and when Josie Gray, my companion of 25 years, uh, the painter and storyteller, when he was alive, I was spending even more time there. Um, but uh, I, ha I uh, had a have a chair there that faces out toward Loch Arrow, which is a beautiful lake. And I love film, and so I would order up films. They were, in those days, they came in the mail and uh, put them into my computer. And if I got on to a filmmaker, I would watch every single film they made. And I had gotten on to Enritu. 
and I had watched every single film. And when I came home to America that time, my agent wrote to me and said, we have a Mexican here. He has a, a, he has a, a script and he wants to use a story of Raymond Carver's in a film. Uh, what should we do? I said, what is the name of this Mexican uh, filmmaker? Alejandro Gonzalez Inarritu, she wrote. Beautiful name. I said, send me that script immediately. Because I knew exactly who it was, and I was very excited. I thought, my gosh, how can it be? I just saw all his films, and now here comes the script. Right. You know? And uh, so uh, I, I read the script, and I just was very uh, excited even more so. And I wrote back the agent, and I said, well, we will make this film with him. We will... Um, uh, give Ray's story over to him because I have uh, eminent trust in him from knowing his films and uh, this this is this is really wonderful I'm really very happy so how, how involved were you in the uh, story development or in the um, production of the film or as a consultant I could have been a lot more involved but it would have meant uh, being in New York you see and uh, I, I really didn't want to. If you see where I am, it's so beautiful here. Why would I give this up for New York? You know, <laughs> <laughs> it just isn't in the cards. And uh, but I did stay um, for a couple of days there, and I went on set. I met him. I took my grandson uh, via my late companion Josie Gray, his, his grandson, and well, you know, uh, they've, they haven't had any other grandmother than me, so, and uh, Brian Cuesta, and he, he introduced himself to uh, Alejandro and says, this is my grandmother, <laughs> Tess. Oh. So it was a beautiful moment because I, I, I'd never heard him do that. But he's um, now a, a musician and a composer, and he's studying in Graz in uh, Austria, oh. uh, digital music. That sounds exotic. And he's a very wonderful young man. And he came uh, to hear me read uh, from my new book, Is Is Not, in Dublin. And afterwards, we walked all around the uh, Temple Bar area arm in arm uh, with his mother and my niece. And uh, he... He's very tall, and he bent down to me, and he said, Tess, I, I am so proud of you. I am so proud how you gave those poems, you know. So it's one of the nicer things that happened. But, uh, yeah, he got to meet uh, Alejandro with me, and uh, it was a very good meeting. I told a lot of stories about Ray to Alejandro to give him kind of the scent of Ray, you know, and, yeah. um, and the life that we shared, yeah, uh, which was uh, very beautiful. And although 10 years, it was uh, uh, really time is not time, you know, it's, uh, it was uh, much longer and deeper and... He's been gone now over 30 years, but uh, those 10 years uh, are, that's the currency that underwrites me. <laughs> yeah. So, it, it, and based upon the research that I did before I got here, it sounds like you were together for 10 years and then a couple of months before he passed, you decided to get married. Is that right? Yes. We got married. Uh, we went to Reno. We just felt, I, I've written about this uh, at the beginning of his uh, last book. I wrote an essay, which you could find, and uh, that book of his was called A New Path to the Waterfall, and I wrote an essay about his last days with me and um, tried to give some feeling of, of, of how we we were living at that time. And uh, I think it is one of my best uh, pieces of writing, actually. I, I will look for it. Um, one of the stories I read to prepare for the interview was a piece, um, Inedito. Um, does that look familiar to you? Oh, and, yes. Uh, uh -huh. And you were talking about a cross-country trip that you took with Ray. 
Uh-huh. And it was, I think you said it was the only long trip in a car that you took with him in your entire time together, but right. you decided to write a couple of plays yes, along the we way. Did. <laughs> and you, you had on your lap at, well, you, you've been known at least to have a typewriter yes. on your lap in the car. That's right. <laughs> but here you were writing longhand and he was sort of dictating and you were contributing, obviously, and this was a, a collaborative effort. I thought it was really poignant the way you described how you work together. You said we're like two hummingbirds and you don't know where one ends and the other begins. Yes, that's for sure how yeah. it was. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty pretty special way to describe very, very a relationship. special relationship. It was very soul tearing to to lose him, you know. Uh although I I still have him in the very um, amazing way. I, we're still um, <laughs> communicating, it seems, you know. I, I, at least that's my feeling, that I, I still know him and can find him, you know, in my days. Yeah. There's, there's a, it's just a kind of incalculable uh, presence that, that does uh, stay by me. But what do you think he would say or or think about the stories, his stories being turned into film, like Shortcuts, which I oh, re- he rewatched again it. this week? And oh, yeah, Birdman. he would have absolutely loved uh, the whole process. He would have enjoyed meeting Robert Altman the whole time I was down there. I was down there about two weeks for for the filming of, of Shortcuts, of, of Shortcuts, and then I did go out to to New York. Or when the film came out, you know, um, the premiere of it yeah. in Lincoln Center. I was there for that. What what an ensemble cast that was. Fantastic. I met a lot of them. Oh, it was, Robert Downey Jr., Madeline yes. Stowe, and Tim Robbins. I, I'm lo- I rewatched it this week, and, and I'm looking at all of these stars, these movie stars, mm-hmm. and I don't know that any director has put together that many A-list actors in one movie ever. Well, I mean, you know, he he was an auteur director and they would have worked for him, some of them for nothing. You know, the crew especially told me, members of the crew, you know, we would work for him for nothing. Yeah. You know, they they just enjoyed it all so much. One thing I've always appreciated about Robert Altman was the sort of the cacophonous the 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 environment that he creates on film where there's people talking in other rooms Mm -hmm. and he doesn't try to mute that at all like normally a director would want all of the focus to be on whoever's talking Mm -hmm. but he embraces this Mm -hmm. sort of chaotic um Mm -hmm. real life um situation and and it i can't i'm terrible at describing cinema and in literature but that's something that really distinguishes Robert Altman, I think, in movies. Well, he, he knows that we talk in overlap, you know, because when somebody else is talking too often, we're thinking what we're going to say before they've even finished, you right. know. And so <laughs> I suppose that's one way of representing that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, isn't, and isn't that kind of what Ray, Ray captured too in his writing sometimes is this kind of messiness of, mm-hmm. of dialogue, Mm-hmm. That made Although it he was real. very crisp too, uh, you know, uh, I think that that sense that a period could stop the heart, you know, in in his way of of writing is, is very crucial. Yeah. So you got your start in Port Angeles. Um, is that? Where, I was born here. Uh, you were, that's a start. Start. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, the Buddhists uh, believe that we started way out before that. Okay. But. but <laughs> so, and you grew up. This is a logging community, right? Well, my father was a Jippo logger. A Jippo is somebody who's on their own. That is, he makes his own way. He will sometimes take a casual partner. Um, um, my mother worked with my father. She ended up uh, bearing uh, five children. Uh, at some point, she had to get out, but she he was a spar tree rigger. A spar tree rigger is somebody who climbs these 180-foot um, trees, limbing the tree as he goes up, and has a pulley on his belt to to set at the top of that tree, and that is used then um, to yard the logs into a landing. That was the old way of logging. 
And uh, my mother was um, the choker setter. Mm. She would take that cable, that steel cable, was about as big as maybe three of your fingers together, and uh, she would uh, pull that out to the newly felled tree and with a snaffle get that around that tree, and then it would be yarded in to be cut up into pulp wood. Sounds like hard work. It was extremely hard and dangerous, dangerous work. Yeah. Well, I, I know that logging, the, the danger of just limbs, not just the trees, but I mean, just the limbs on the trees can fall and kill Well, kill she, sa she saved our li my life and my brother's life one time, my mother did, because the trees fall in ways you don't expect. Uh, and uh, this tree um, started to fall toward us, and I can still remember my father saying, get him, get him, get him. And he could see the tree was going to hit us. And my mother flew somehow across that distance and uh, swooped down on us and pushed us into an indentation. And this, this tree fell right on top of us. But we were in this indentation and the limbs uh, came down, the boughs came down on us. But we, we survived. Hmm. We weren't killed. It was, she, she saved our lives. Oh, wow. <laughs> how, how old were you? Well, I was five when I went into the woods, so I could have been seven or eight, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us about how you made your way to the university district, because I think that's where Alfredo said he, he yeah. met you. Well, uh, I didn't come from this house. This house was just being finished as I left Port Angeles, um, where, where we're talking from. Uh, I came from a little house uh, in town at 1329 Caroline Street. And uh, my father had not understood really who I was. And uh, he can be forgiven because, uh, you know, I hardly knew myself. But I did know that I wanted to get an education and I had saved money. And I was going to Seattle, and I was going to go to the University of Washington, and I had a very close friend, and she was also going with me. And my father, when I was getting ready to leave, I was 17, he reached in his pocket, and he gave me $50. And that was a lot of money then. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound like much now. Yeah. But he gave that to me. And... Uh, and so that's what I started out with from him. Of course, I had saved some hundreds of dollars. to, um, And then I, I got a grant also, uh, a National Defense Fund grant later on. For writing? Uh, for, uh, well, you know, you could apply for these grants. Oh, just to anybody, go to school. Yeah. Just to go to school. Yeah. That's what it was for. Hmm. And uh, So what year are we talking about here? Uh, I graduated in 1961. So I would have been going probably 62 or, yeah, I'm not sure whether, I guess 61 maybe that fall. Uh -huh. Right as the Vietnam War is sort of ramping up. No, uh -huh. Vietnam War was later. Yeah. It was much later. Uh, 68 was the, the top of that war. You know, when things, when I was involved with the war, when my first husband was a pilot oh. in that war. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know you... Mm -hmm. We're married to yes, a, uh, Lawrence Lovette. Gallagher, who I have my name from, and mm -hmm. um, he was a pilot, um, jet pilot. Oh, uh, F nine. Yeah, and then and what what became of of that marriage? Did it end in divorce? Well, he or? went to the war. Oh, I was with him five years in the training. I'm probably the only woman you'll meet who has actually taxied an F9 down a <laughs> runway. <laughs> but uh, um, it, it was a very interesting life. Um, we, he, he had wanted to be an astronaut, and this is the way that you got to become an astronaut, was that you, you went into the Navy. And that was why he was in the Navy. He wasn't in the Navy to go to Vietnam. But as he was being trained, I said to him, you know, that war is really heating up. I'm really frightened for you. I'm afraid that's where you're going to end up, is Vietnam. And sure enough, they started to send boys then to Vietnam. And uh, a lot of his cohorts, uh, you know, were helicopter pilots. 
and they ended up in the jungle of Vietnam. That's where my dad ended up. He he was in... 174th Assault Helicopter Company. A helicopter. He was a pilot, too. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, um, your your mates uh, sometimes uh, were not up to this. you, for jet pilots, uh, you were not in contact with the damage that you did. You could see it from great height, um, but you were napalming and strafing, and uh, it was really soul-killing stuff. Yeah. So when he came back, all those dreams we had as young people were not uh, easy for us to reapproach. And, uh, and in that time, because I had been uh, really uh, a child uh, growing up in a beautiful wilderness here, and that was the first time I had been away from home uh, outside of the Northwest to go to all these training posts, which were in the South, you know. Uh, I lived for a year in godforsaken Meridian, Mississippi, you know, <laughs> where civil rights workers, three of them were murdered. Yeah. And um, if you want a blood-curdling place, uh, Meridian, Mississippi, in that time, you know, would be, that was when the Neshoba County Sheriff uh, was uh, in charge there. And uh, if you have seen Mississippi burning, you will get a good idea of what that was like there. And um, that's, in fact, where I got my name, Tess, was in Meridian, Mississippi, because I met a man, an actor from Durban, South Africa. And uh, he asked me what I was doing there, and I said, my husband is a pilot. And I said, I'm writing poems. And he said, well, what's your name? I said, my name is Theresa Gallagher. And he said, <laughs> No, no, you'll never, you'll never get poems published with Theresa Gallagher. No, no, I think you should be Tess. <laughs> so, so he renamed me, and as, as it turned out, uh, I became the secretary uh, of the theater there, and he was an actor from Durban, South Africa, and so he um, began to act in the theater, and he called me Tess the whole time. So that, that name stuck. Huh. And when I went to send out my next poems, that's the name I use. Great advice. With Tess. It obviously Tess worked. Gallagher, and they, yeah. came, and they took the poems, so and then I listened to him. <laughs> did, you, did you write poetry in high school? Well, I, I tried, let's say. I was, a, you know, I was flailing away at it, yeah. Uh, I had a wonderful teacher here in Port Angeles. Her name was Margaret Matthew. And she had us reading uh, the Atlantic Monthly. And so I w- became aware that there were living poets. They weren't all just dead guys, you know. <laughs> dead poets aside. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so that was good, you know, the, the, that experience. And she was a marvelous teacher. Yeah. So I started writing here. And then I took those poems and auditioned to get into Theodore Recchi's last class, as it turned out. Oh, at UW. At UW, mm-hmm. and uh, I understand he was pretty influential for you. Well, he it, without him, I don't know what would have become of me, really, because uh, he was so formative. He was he was just bigger than life. To see uh, a man of that stature so uh, deeply uh, engaged in the activity and in the life of being a poet. Was, was truly amazing for me. And I, I think there really wasn't a choice after that. That, uh, th- that was a removal of choice, really, to be in his class. So the choice to go in that direction that no longer was a choice after taking that class, obviously there is a choice that you're making before that point to, to go in that direction. And what I'm curious about is why is it that you chose poetry? Maybe it was your high school teacher and the influence she had. But poetry to me seems like, from a young person's standpoint, very difficult to access and, and sort of almost like a foreign language. Even though it's in English, it's not easily digestible. Sometimes you have to read it over and over and over. And even when you do that, you could still be stumped. And, and it's just it's, it's a challenging type of literature. 
And, and I'm wondering what drew you to that despite those challenges, whereas, you know, other writers might just choose to write a straight up story, beginning, middle and end. But I think it helps to know that I was a journalist in this town, that, uh, that I had read Hemingway and that I was hungry for experience. And uh, I, I had uh, knowledge of how journalism had opened the world to him. And I made my money for going to college by working in the summers for the local newspaper here. And so um, I knew uh, what a facticity was, that use of language. But that didn't really serve me. I really was somebody who enjoyed language that uh, was more than, hey, just the facts, you know. I was into mystery, into the mystery of life and to the unseen. What could language make uh, palpable of the unseen? And so that, that's more or less the track that I've followed during my whole career. It doesn't mean that I don't tell stories that are very available in the poems, but I think I am a diviner. I think uh, there, there are things available in my poems that are, that, uh, are subterranean and conjured, that are conjured, should yeah. we say. Great uh, word. I, I'm often between worlds mm -hmm. uh, where I get some of the poems, you know. Yeah, I, I've um, started rereading your, your poetry over the last few weeks, preparing for the interview, and, and I'm struck by what a very short, almost abstract group of words can do emotionally. You know, just mm -hmm. how it can, in a very short period of time, it can tap into something. And it also can be telling, like you say, it, it can tell a story. Mm -hmm. But it just, I think people like me who are, very accustomed to easily digested bits of social media information mm -hmm. and TV and mm -hmm. spoon fed all of the, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, um, it's difficult to go back, but it's, but it's so wor worthwhile to do. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, you know, it's such a rich experience to have poetry and to be connected up to the life of poets. I feel very lucky to have had this life. If I were to go back, I would choose exactly this life again. I don't know if there are people, uh, you know, who feel that way, you know, but uh, at the time I was coming through, there was nobody sitting there saying, oh, hey, we'd like you to become a poet, and this is what you do, you yeah. know? There, there was no map. And these writing programs that have sprung up, they were very young in the country. And Theodore Retke didn't even really know how you were supposed to teach uh, young poets, you know. He made it all up. And we were guinea pigs, so to speak, you know. If you were talking to a group of young people, teenagers, about to graduate from high school or maybe just entering college, and, and they were to ask you, is poetry a viable career path? now in the year 2019 going into 2020 and if so why what would you tell them or how i don't think poetry is a career i think poetry is a vocation which is more like being a priest it is more, it is more like that a priest would not think to go and make money right like can i make money mm -hmm. uh, i don't you would not make money as a poet i i do not make money as a poet there's yeah. no money right um, you just can't sell enough books, and it's just the. It's not about selling. It's not about. It's not about yeah. selling. It's about being. Hmm. It is about what are you as a being, and what can you say about being, about being an emotional, living, breathing creature on the planet. Hmm. You no, know? nice. that's what being a poet is is about, and it's it's just an amazing uh, enterprise. Um, you know, I think one time I actually passed out, um, you know, the sign from Graywell Press about what I had made to my students to try and get them out of the notion that they could make any money, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and in fact, I think I chose poetry as a profession because I was coming along in the 60s, you know, and we were all against the money-making right. um, of, of our, our parents. So... 
you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted something where it wasn't about making money. Do, do you find, though, that when you get into short stories, because you've written a lot of short stories, you have collections. And, I have three books, yes, yeah, uh, short stories. Okay. And um, do you find that that is an easier way to make a living? Uh, because they're maybe sell more books or well, I haven't made a living from my writing at all uh, except as it uh, allows me to have taught uh, and to to be teaching but now I, I I mean and I taught at Syracuse for 10 years I've taught all over America I think I was an excellent teacher up to a certain point and at a certain point I realized that I was getting into a space that was unteachable, that I, it would be a counterfeit for me to say, I can now teach you from this place that I'm at in my own work. And so at that point, I kind of took myself out of teaching as a, as a profession, you know. Mm -hmm. So you just reached a point where it just didn't make sense for you to in, well, I, 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 my work was, was not generated in the same way anybody else's work was coming. You know, I, I depend on lightning. I, I don't just get up and, oh, there's the page, and, oh, somebody has given me a prompt, or I read this or that, and I'm very, very choosy about what I accept, and I wait for, for voices. I wait to be embodied by the poems. And so that's not something that is... Uh, appreciated really as a method. If you're going to be teaching, you really um, have to, you know, come into it the same way that it's done mostly in writers' workshops, you know, where you're given prompts or you're given a poem to approximate, um, or you're given forms, and then you apply yourself. I can't apply myself. I don't apply myself. I had all of that. It's all inside me. I know every bit of all of that. But it, it <laughs> I what, don't know what, really how to explain yeah, it. Yeah, I was, I was just going to ask you what you meant by that. I can't, I, I don't apply myself. I can't apply myself. Are you saying, because I've heard. I'm invitational. Okay, yeah. I have, I maintain an openness and I ask to be, for things to come into me for for voice, for the voice to come into me. I, got, I see. And um, I, I, I can read you my last poem if you want to, and you can see. I'd love to hear it. See if um, if that can, <laughs> if you get a, a sense of it, maybe. <laughs> when you say your last poem, what do you mean? Well, your... the one that I wrote a couple of days ago. Oh, okay. Your most um, recent one. All right. Re ready when you are, Tess. All right. Call me baby in your best bluesy voice. I want to start over, not at the beginning, but where something takes hold that could never belong to me. Breath by the fringe of the sea, I give you back my first child cries, the smear of world that took hold as flesh, time with its shake-down-the-house hunger alarms, its eyelid of dark that even now closes over me with faults restorative. Put your mouth to my ear as to a salt-worn conch, accustomed only to wave spill and withdrawal. Don't remember me. Forget I ever was. Now, as in some farthest shoulder that only leans against time, like the sun leaning its shadow against the cream-white throat of the water moccasin, strike your body-bridging voice against water, its gleam and pull to abolish direction and arrival, safety in every remove, call, call, toward love's farthest outpost, as if you know, even past memory, exactly how to find me. Call me, baby. Ask me, as the 400 cypress cutters swing their blades to sing. Nice. Thank you for that reading. <laughs> yeah, so that is an unpublished Poems Unpublished, yeah. Just a couple days ago. I just wrote it a couple days ago, yeah. 
Wow. So you talk about lightning and and poems coming to you and inspiration coming to you. I have heard Stephen King describe writing as follows. Uh, ass plus chair equals writing. That seems to me to be kind of antithetical to your approach <laughs> to writing, exactly. which is you're you're really looking for or waiting for inspiration. Whereas Stephen King is sitting down and saying, all right, just do the work, you know, just open up your laptop or your notebook and do the well, work. Believe me, yeah. I have done the work. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise I could not receive and I wouldn't know how to manage what I receive right. if I had not done the work. Yeah, well, it, as evidenced by the the numerous collections of of stories and poems that are yeah all over this house, it's and, a, you know, um, the work. You know, he he's involved in in fiction and in larger forms. My form is a small, large form. My form is very large, but it is small. It, it 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 seems to have a smaller surface. It just has a smaller surface. But I feel that uh, poems are very large, you know, yeah. very wonderful containers. Yeah, well, they're they're big in terms of um, the ideas that they're communicating, and also I think more importantly, the emotions that they evoke. Right. And the diversity of experiences. Well, how how one poem? I think when when somebody watches a Stephen King movie or reads a Stephen King book, the audience for the most part, has pretty much the same experience. They're going through the, the journey of the protagonist and the antagonist, and there's, mm -hmm. you know, monsters and ghosts, and, um, and I, I don't want to diminish Stephen King's work at all. Uh, but when I compare a Stephen King novel to poetry, which can be interpreted in as many different ways as there are readers, because of that, that experience that you bring to it will completely affect how you interpret those words and those phrases, if that makes sense. Yes, I mean, it, it, poetry uh, brings out of you uh, many things you don't expect, you know, as a reader. And so it asks you to be a wilderness again, you yeah. know, and uh, to rediscover how you feel uh, in terms of what's given in the poem. I, I want to ask you about your your friendship with Alfredo mm -hmm. and his wife. And the, the the thing that I am most impressed with, uh, with um, hearing about your journey with him and his journey with you throughout the 60s and 70s and all the way through the present and following his Facebook feed and seeing the pictures that he puts up there of your, your get-togethers, um, the, the strong bond that the, the little community that you've created of, of friends is so impressive. I'm wondering how you nurture and cultivate friendships in your life and how important those friendships are to you in your life. Well, I think they're everything, really. Um, I've been friends with Alfredo for before, before he and Susie married, actually, you know. Um, I would say at least 55 years. Now, how many friends do you have that go back that that far, you see, right. and um, uh, I met him, you know, when I first was in Seattle, um, we were all hungry, you know, we just didn't have enough to eat, we had very, very little money. Literally hungry. Literally, <laughs> we were really starving, and he worked at a place called Campos, uh, which he may have talked to you about, and uh, he would feed us. The man who owned that place was very generous to young students. We would go in there with our tongues hanging out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, he's, he uh, was our Montparnasse. He, what is that? Montparnasse yeah. was in, in Paris. It was where all the wonderful artists and poets uh, congregated. Okay. And uh, so he, for us in Seattle, he was our Montparnasse. He was the place to go, the place to be. And uh, he had in his house a big long table, and we would all gather there in the afternoons, and he would hold forth, and we would, uh, you know, say what we had to say, and we would have great political arguments. And, and um, I became his... his uh, a kind of amuse uh, 
at some point, uh, I, I um, was a model for him uh, when he was uh, teaching painting um, over on Capitol Hill for the city at some point, I think. And uh, and uh, so a lot of a lot of art uh, was made just of of me and and posing and he taught me a lot about uh, that and and I learned about art and I really fell in love with art through through Alfredo and the the friendship has maintained over the years and to this day you're you're spending time with him and socializing with him and oh, Susie yes. Lytle is who's also an artist. He's he's my brother in art. He really is my brother. And Susie is my sister. When I uh had cancer, breast cancer in 2002, uh she looked after me. And she's an, a marvelous painter and person and uh and she took me in uh to her house, you know, and she she went you know, with me through that, those operations. Uh, just, just wonderful, uh, caring people. And Alfredo uh, has done several paintings of me. I don't know how, we have stopped counting really. But uh, a, a very crucial time for us was when I uh, began to be with Raymond Carver and Ray had stopped drinking. And I had this idea that if Alfredo could meet Ray, that that part of him might fall away. Uh, Alfredo's drinking? His drinking, yeah. yes. And um, so I took Ray to meet him. And what I had hoped for happened. And it uh, was even larger, something that I, I really hadn't even thought of, was that Alfredo threw away his cigarettes. He not only stopped drinking, he threw away his cigarettes. And that's why he's still with us and Ray is not. Mm -hmm. Because Ray kept the cigarettes and oh. was, was smoking, you know, right up until his operation uh, in October 1st uh, of um, 1987, uh, before his death in, in August 2nd, uh, 1988. Uh, Ray was smoking until right before that operation, which they took two thirds of his left lung. Oh yeah. He got lung cancer and then it he spread to cancer. his brain, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so you introduced Ray to Alfredo. To Alfredo and Alfredo was so um, impressed with his presence and with the accomplishment of his sobriety and uh, the embodiment of that in, in, in the man he was meeting that he immediately changed his life. I, rem I remember seeing the story that Ray wrote about, or Menudo. inspired, yeah, Menudo, mm -hmm. in that book about Alfredo, right. and, and seeing your tribute to him in there as well, to Alfredo, mm -hmm. in this book. And I'll, I'll just tell the listeners what it is. It's Alfredo Aragin's uh, World of Wonders, mm -hmm. uh, Critical Perspectives. It's just a- well, It's a Lauro's book. Uh -huh. be beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful book. Yes. Um, but- Reading your tribute to Alfredo brought tears to my eyes because <laughs> I think that I, at least I I have this feeling about my own life, and I think people from my generation generally have this feeling of inadequacy as friends because we're, pull, we're pulled in so many different directions vocationally and with our family, and we just don't have really strong friendships, hmm. and we we long for that oh. those connections. And so that's what I gleaned from the book and from right. your, your writings and Ray's writings about Alfredo and also my interview with him. I was like, this is amazing. And Alfredo has a daughter. It's not like he um, was, he found the time to nurture and cultivate those friendships mm -hmm. with you. And I just was so impressed yes, with that. We have stayed by each other, you know, and it's such a rich thing to share your art with another artist, you know. And whenever I was teaching, uh, I had some money coming in, and so I was buying paintings. You know, he made a decision not to teach and not to go into university as a teacher, but that meant that they had to live very close to the bone. And, uh, and as a poet, I had a little bit of disposable income, and um, I would buy paintings on what we call in Ireland the drip. 
you know, we buy it on the drip with just a little bit of money at a time. Uh But that was helpful to them because they always had some money that they could depend on. Turned out to be pretty good investments though, right? Well, I would never sell (laughs) any painting that I own. But in terms of the value that you got from The value was in the friendship really and in the sustaining action of knowing that the money was going to support two artists. That was the 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 benefit really for me right and we're we're in a room right now i know we don't have uh, video cameras here but we're we're looking at two gorgeous portraits of of you mm-hmm. uh, painted by alfredo and can you tell us about these paintings well this one here um our lady of poetry the first time i laid eyes on that painting was i was coming back from uh being overseas uh, being in europe and uh, came through the door at Alfredo's. I was in the habit of coming straight from the airport to his house, and then I would usually spend the night there and decompress and tell them every, all the adventures. And this painting was right inside the door, and I was just stopped by it. And I just stopped, and I looked at it, and I said, Oh, Look at all those little hummingbirds drinking from my sweetness. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice that until you just pointed that out. And, That's great. Uh, Alfredo just burst out laughing, you know, because I am. I'm entirely surrounded by hummingbirds, and they have their beaks, you know, uh, pointed toward me and uh, seem to be getting some nourishment there. And there are these beautiful um red berries with little spikes of light on them and his patternings Uh, you know when i traveled i would bring back pieces of wallpaper or anything with patterns that i thought was amazing and i could see in this painting some of the wallpaper that i brought from china i went to china yeah and uh can't remember what year it was it was before ten in men and um and I brought back a wallpaper for him, and I could see two pieces from that. And just some of the design reminds me. So so um, I did that as an ongoing thing to bring um, pattern back to him. Yeah, because he, he does have a lot of patterns in his paintings that are repeated and mm-hmm. almost like fractals. Yeah, he's, he's called a, pa- a pattern painter. And um, so how about this other painting across the room? This one is more statuesque and very spiritual feeling to me. And uh, she's very close to my young self. And he's working from a photograph by Jerry Bauer that was taken in Syracuse. Jerry Bauer was a, is a very... I don't know if he's still living, but he was a wonderful uh, photographer who took photos of me while I was in Syracuse. And this one, um, the green-eyed poet, uh, is also coming off of a photograph. And I don't remember who took that one right now. But the main element is the are the eyes, the green mm-hmm. eyes. And uh, I think that I said... I, I'm, I must have called her the green-eyed poet in one of my communications to Alfredo because that became the, the title for her. She has her mouth open. The other one has, her, uh, Our Lady has her mouth closed. And she seems to be kind of astonished and looking steadily out at the world. Yeah, she does. And, and uh, the, the face is cradled by the hands and I always have a lot of rings on my fingers and <laughs> you can uh, see that blue ring that Ray gave me ha- he has turned it to green to match the eyes yeah and the the painting that you sent me in an email with you with the Dick Tracy hat on um, is that a painting or is that an image that he created digitally he created that digitally okay yeah, that I don't. I don't have that. I don't think that's come out anywhere. I think it's just <laughs> uh, on the internet, probably. So, how how does it feel to have a friend, a good friend like Alfredo, spend? And I think he spends a, a good four to six weeks on a single painting, doesn't he? He used to spend three months, um, 
but he's gotten to where he can work faster and faster as he has, you know, um, gotten his method down. Um, this one, I think, took a very long time. Yeah, but how, how does that feel? I mean, to to have that sustained dedication and concentration on you, his muse, for these paintings, that must be just beyond flattering. Oh, I, I don't know about that. I, I, I just don't feel uh, flattery. I don't come present really to that. I, I feel it, it is uh, in tribute to our friendship. He gave me the green eyed, the green eyed poet painting. That was a gift, and he had it so beautifully framed. I think of these as uh, gifts of the heart. And uh, the, that uh, these are embodiments of friendship, love, and of his uh, being sustained by poetry, too. It's not only one way that he gave me these paintings. That's coming because we are in an exchange. We are in a communication of our energies, of our presences. So you, you, you mentioned that you you would do it all over again. Yeah, um, I feel so lucky to have found my vocation, uh, you know, from the very start. I mean, just a young girl. Right. And how many people get to find what will matter to them for, you know, a lifetime. I'm now 76, you know. But does that so, also mean then, if, if you would do it all over again, that doesn't mean you don't have regrets, right? Are there are there regrets that you can about my being a poet? No. About in, about any of your vocational choices or uh, moves geographically or anything like no, that? No, I don't have any regrets. That's amazing. No, yeah. I totally accept the adventure that I've had. <laughs> I feel so lucky. What What does a day in the life of Tess Gallagher look like today? Well, today I got up. I usually drink some very strong coffee at the start. Um, I start with watching the hummingbirds and just kind of meditating on, on their, uh, getting their morning nourishment, you know, from the feeders. Um, I stayed where at the house where Ray and I lived together and where Josie Gray and I lived together, where my mother lived uh, also for the last year of her life. And um, that's a house we might go over to if you have time. And um, that's where I was. I, I uh, sleep upstairs there. Um, and uh, of course, I couldn't write today because I was going to meet you. So I, I instead read some poetry. Um, a wonderful poet, Linda Gregg, uh, who was young with me. She's a West Coast poet who then moved out to the East Coast. Um, and like me, spent a lot of time on the East Coast. I did all my teaching, my main body of teaching on the East Coast. Um, but she stayed there, and I came back West. After Raymond Carver died, I left uh, Syracuse, New York, and came back uh, to Port Angeles and uh, was here uh, looking after my mother, Minnie. Mm. Yeah, I'd love to go to the property. Yeah, today. So if you have time, yeah, we'll go and and see see what you can say about um, <laughs> everything I've collected over there. It's a, a real incrustation of uh, <laughs> uh, of lives coming together there. Yeah. Well, I I don't know if I ever fully told told you my frame of reference in terms of Ray Carver. I told you I was from Yakima. Yes. Uh, but I went to YVC and. Yakima Valley Community College, uh -huh. and that's where I understand Ray went as well. Um, and uh -huh. uh, it, the the lore at, at YVC was that he flunked out of YVC. That what? That he flunked out of YVC. That's the 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 lore at to the community college that the English professors would sort uh -huh. of brag about. Like, hey, he was here. He was one of our students. He definitely was. Um, uh, he made a name for himself, obviously, and became hugely uh -huh. successful. Um, but I took some English classes at YVC where the, 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 the subject for the entire semester was reading Ray Carver. Uh -huh. And then I went up to Western in Bellingham, mm -hmm. and that's where I met you for the first time. You don't remember me probably, but 
It was just a reading. It was a poetry reading uh-huh. at the uh, Village Books in Bellingham. Oh, yes. uh-huh. And that's, I think it was for The Lover of Horses. Sure, that's book. been quite a while. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I was just there. I was just there about a week or two ago. Oh, yeah. back to Village Books? Uh huh. Yeah. To read from um, Is Is Not. So tell us about Is Is Not and how far back those poems go, that collection. Well, it took actually five years for the writing of the book, but then uh, Grey Wolf has become such an enterprise and has so many writers now that it. Uh, I had to get in line to get the book published, so it took three years of waiting, of just waiting for the book uh, to be able to be printed. Yeah, so... So it's about eight years. So when you put out a collection of poems like that, and um, it's out on Amazon, that's where I got my copy, you tour and do readings? Is that right. kind of how you promote right. the book? I, I've given quite a few readings in, in Ireland. I am published by a uh, British... Uh, publisher, uh, Blood Axe Press, and they uh, their their books are available in Ireland. And uh, Neil Astley has been my editor, my British editor. And so the, I gave a reading on my birthday in Dublin, which was very exciting, and uh, had a, a lot of uh, Dublin friends around, and some friends from Port Angeles came. And as I mentioned earlier, my grandson was there, and Josie's uh, daughter, his mother, uh, Paula, was there. And my niece was there, Rigel Barber. She had swum uh, uh, two-thirds of the way across the Irish Sea to Scotland. Oh, my goodness. And uh, <laughs> she's, a, she's an open-water uh, swimmer and without, without a wetsuit. <laughs> oh my gosh! And uh, so, but she uh, she had to be taken out because she got pulmonary edema. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, so, but she was there for the reading and gives me a lot of support and usually comes and spends a month or so with me in Ireland. When did you first make that connection or reconnection to Ireland and start spending time there? I've been going there for fifty years. At least, yeah. And I and talk about having friendships for 50 years. I have friendships there that are every bit 50 years long. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so you have a, a cottage or a home there? I bought a cottage there about 13 years ago. And it was uh, very rudimentary. And I had to put a heating system in and, uh, you know, get better windows and doors and... Uh, I redesigned it a bit and uh, had a garage, which I turned into a studio, into a painting studio for my companion, Josie Gray, huh. who was Irish. And uh, he was a, a wonderful painter and storyteller. Yeah. So what what is it about Ireland? I know you have roots in Ireland, it sounds like, in terms of ancestry. Mm-hmm. But what is it about the location, the geography, the people that draws you to spend time there every year? Oh, there's so many things. Uh, I think the writers in Ireland are just some of the best uh, we have on the planet, you know. And uh, when I was young, I hung out with singers and poets and storytellers. Uh, The Boys of the Lock, they were very close friends. And I went to a lot of their concerts and I learned some Sean Knowles singing from from one of the singers. And... You know, all there was a clutch of Belfast poets um, that I became very closely associated with: Kieran Carson, Michael Longley, Paul Muldoon, Maeve McGookian. Those are just some of them, <laughs> and uh, it was a very exciting time because poets and musicians spoke to each other and were interested in what uh, each other were doing. And I traveled all over Ireland with these writers and singers and musicians. Cahill McConnell of the Boys of the Lock was a very big influence uh, on me. You know, that's an interesting theme or a thread that kind of runs through all of the interviews that I'm doing with artists and creatives is they, they always seem to find a community mm-hmm. of like-minded uh, people who have the same values, artistic values and ambitions. And do you, do you find that that community is integral to artistic development and, and being well, you able want, to... Well, you want to um, 
to bring something to them. I, I brought uh, to that to the Irish writers and uh, singers um, American poets and tried to interest them in those poets, you know, and to read them aloud and to tell them what I thought of those poets and uh, share those, you know. And I think that was a very good cross-pollination, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Kieran Carson has recently passed. I was very close to him. He's just one of the greatest uh, Irish poets. Uh, and I knew Seamus Heaney. I read with Seamus Heaney. He was a Nobel Prize winning poet. Mm. Uh, I introduced him to Josie Gray. Josie really didn't know <laughs> the literature of his country yeah. until he met me. Um, I just think that, you know, it's part of your grounding to be among artists, you know, and to strive to be as uh, good as you can be. Yeah. You know, and to have their respect. And to be among poets in Northern Ireland at that time of the Troubles, uh, I mean, I was a kind of revolutionary tourist, if you will. <laughs> Although I wasn't really a tourist, I was taken in very um, intimately into this group of writers. And I think I influenced them to a good degree. And I, uh, Kieran actually came to America and, and went around with me. And uh, and then he took things back to Ireland. I like that word cross pollination. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good way to describe it. Thank you for sitting down with me and inviting me into your home. It's beautiful. The setting is lovely, and um, this has been a really special talk. Hey, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Dream Path Podcast. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to your favorite podcast service and give me a rating and review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. I appreciate your time. And as always, go find your dream path.